All right, we're going to cover some of the survival strategies associated with shame. They are uh, <clears throat> the survival strategies that we will be talking about. They are maladaptive strategies. They are not um, strategies in a traditional sense that we would want to use in order to help us to deal with our anger or to deal with shame. But they're common strategies used um, when we're having shame issues. And some of them, uh, they happen at a subconscious level where we may not even notice that it's going on, but it will continue to cause problems for us if they're not addressed. Okay, so the first one we get to is denial. And whenever we hear denial, right, you might think of uh, somebody denying something, right? Somebody, you're saying something and they're saying that it's not true. But this is different. So that's somebody actually denying something, uh, denying whether or not it's true. Whereas in this sense, we're talking about somebody being in denial, right? So in this case, the person, it's, it's not necessarily even consciously doing this, right? So they don't even know it's, it, it exists. All right. The first defense is denial. Someone who is in denial simply stays unaware of his shame. He deceives himself into believing he has no shame, when in fact, he would experience great shame if he were fully aware of what was happening inside. He badly wants to believe he is completely acceptable to himself and to others. And so he blinds himself to whatever would bring him shame. And this denial happens in many different ways. So in the anger management context, um, we can be in denial as to our behavior, uh, the way that we treat people, uh, the things that bother us or don't bother us. And even in, if you are, um, let's say if you have a substance use disorder, for example, and you're in recovery, uh, sometimes the person may be in denial as to their uh, status in recovery or whether or not they actually have uh, issues with addiction. And then we get to withdrawal. So withdrawal, you can think of withdrawal as the flight, right? So when we talk about fight or flight, excuse me, or fight, flight, or freeze, uh, that happens when we are encountered with a dangerous situation, right? The withdrawal is part of the flight, right? Because you're trying to withdraw from the situation. And even though it's called fight or flight or freeze, the flight doesn't necessarily mean that you're literally running away, right? but you're getting away from the situation. You're removing yourself from the situation so that you don't have to deal with it. Another survival strategy against shame is withdrawal. People withdraw when they have been touched by shame and personal contact with others is too painful to handle. Flight is a normal reaction to situations when people feel exposed and vulnerable. Withdrawal is a common reaction to shame. Remember, that the initial physical reaction to shame is to break eye contact and look down or aside. A person who is shamed more or less says to his companions, right now, I feel so bad about myself, I cannot look at you in the eye. I can't stay close to you because that will only increase my shame. Already feeling naked before the world, a person who is excessively shamed certainly doesn't want another person to stare at him. He believes, at least temporarily, that everyone can see his soul, see that he's inadequate and bad. So again, this withdrawal is just getting away from the situation, and it could happen in a number of different ways. So one of the other techniques that we'll talk about uh, in upcoming lessons is a timeout, right? So you take a time out and you withdraw from the situation. And that withdrawal is a little bit different in, the, in that you are going to withdraw from the situation, but then you will return and address the situation when the time is more appropriate. You're simply withdrawing in order to not 
uh, escalate the situation any further when you're, um, let's say, in a bad mood or already um, your anger is escalating. Perfectionism. Now, perfectionism, um, you know, most of us have heard of somebody that has a perfectionist uh, personality or, or deal with perfectionism. Now, this doesn't mean that the person is perfect, right? Because none of us are perfect. However, um, again, this is one of those maladaptive uh, strategies that people use to try to prevent shame. And the person that's dealing with perfectionism, they try to do anything and everything in order to uh, not make a mistake. And when they do make a mistake, they feel excessive shame over making a mistake, even though uh, mistakes are common and you know a natural part of us as being human beings. But for the person who deals with excessive shame, it ends up being a big problem. And uh, the person sometimes will spin out of control over a seemingly small mistake because if their way of looking at it, either you get it perfect or it's a complete failure. And that's not the case. Another defense against shame is perfectionism. The perfectionist dreads making mistakes because he thinks mistakes prove something is fundamentally wrong with him as a person. If he fails at something, he believes he is a total failure. The perfectionist may not be particularly arrogant. He is not really trying to play God when he tries to be faultless. He is simply trying to hold shame at bay a little longer. He feels a tremendous pressure to perform, to demonstrate to the world and to himself that he is adequate. Constantly aware of the possibility of shame, he is convinced that others are watching for, for imperfections. And when they see his flaws, they will judge him to be worthless. So again, it in the person's thinking, it's not always this clear, right? That the person you know, is clearly thinking uh, that the person is going to uh, feel that they're completely worthless or a complete failure. And these are more so um, judgments that the individual have on themselves, right? And they believe that other people are going to judge them similarly to the way that they're judging themselves. And so they therefore try to be perfect in everything that they do but it doesn't quite work out, which ends up escalating uh, their anger related situations because no one's perfect. So they're, they're from the outset, starting with an uh, unattainable goal. So they're, they're trying to set a goal that they can never possibly obtain, which is being perfect, right? We can continually get better. Like they say, the old cliche practice makes perfect, for example, but in reality, practice makes better. As we continue to practice, we get better and better, but never perfect. What happens when a person who is deeply shamed cannot withdraw? Oh, excuse me. So this is uh, rage. So rage uh, uh, is obviously a major issue with those of us who have uh, anger management issues. And one of the big things with rage is that when we go into a rage, we're generally not going to be thinking clearly and we're going to make rash decisions and we're not going to, uh, generally we're not going to accomplish our intended goals. What happens when a person who is deeply shamed cannot withdraw from a threatening situation? Rage, another survival strategy against shame is like is a likely response. The enraged person is shouting a warning. Don't get any closer. You're getting too near my shame. And I don't let anyone see that part of me. Stay away or I will attack. An enraged person is desperate to keep others far away so they cannot destroy him. Rage works. It drives people away and so protects the person from revealing his shame. Sometimes it works too well people start to avoid enraged people who are oversensitive and perceive their comments as insults. The enraged person's strategy to defend against overwhelming shame is very debilitating 
to the person's self-esteem. This person will probably feel all the more defective when others become too scared to reach out to them. Rage breaks the connection between people and so increases the shamed person's shame. Chronically enraged people become trapped in a lonely world of their own making. Anyone might respond with rage occasionally, especially when they are suddenly and unexpectedly embarrassed. But people, and it says persons, but people who, uh, people with excessive shame may express their anger more often. Their regular bouts of rage cover up deeper shame. Their attacks on others direct attention away from their sense of inadequacy. So again, um, anger is one of our defense mechanisms against feeling vulnerable. Anything that makes us feel afraid, vulnerable, sad, lonely, um, if we have abandonment issues, all of these things, anger will come in as one of those defenses because as we begin to get angry, we have less of those other primary emotions because mm -hmm. anger is a secondary emotion, right? And, it gen and it's generally fueled by other more primary emotions. And those other primary emotions are those ones that make us feel weak, right? Uh, arrogance. So arrogance is another issue um, that will tend to uh, be used by people when they're trying to avoid shame or feelings of inadequacy. And arrogance is a, a low self-esteem issue, even though some people may misinterpret it if they don't actually understand self-esteem, they may think that the arrogant person is overly confident and has too much self-esteem. But uh, rarely is that the case. Uh, well, if they're arrogant, never is that the case, right? The arrogant person generally will have low self-esteem and they try to overcompensate. And in here, it actually talks about two different types of arrogance such as uh, grandiosity and contempt. One defense against shame is arrogance. When a person convinces himself that he is better than everyone else, there are two ways of displaying arrogance, grandiosity or contempt. Grandiosity is when a person inflates his sense of self-worth so that he believes he is better than others. Contempt is when a person put down someone else to make that person seem smaller. And so we, we see the, both of these uh, regularly, people will use these. Some people may use both. Some people may use one or the other. So again, with the grandiosity, the person is trying to make themselves bigger and better or appear bigger and better than everyone else. Whereas with the contempt, right? Um, the person is, is trying to make the other person small. So even if they don't necessarily um, uh, try to inflate their own ego, uh, in this case, they're still trying to belittle the other person to make the other person small. Uh, you know, back in the days, they would talk about, you know, stepping on someone else to try to uh, bring yourself up. Some excessively shamed uh, people practice grandiosity. Others practice contempt. Many people use both forms of arrogance to protect themselves against their inner sense of shame. An arrogant person places himself on a pedestal where nobody can see his shame, not even himself. The price he pays is not being connected to others. The beauty of intimacy with others cannot be warm on a pedestal. The arrogant person has set himself apart from all those who would or could love him. True, he may appear to avoid feeling worse than others do by exchanging feelings of inferiority for feelings of superiority, but he fails to touch the center of his pain, the shame. And so again, even, even using this arrogance and exchanging these feelings of uh, inferiority for feelings of superiority, is, <clears throat> excuse me, as it mentioned, it's, it's uh, temporary, right? It's, it's not something that's going to be lasting. And in most cases, 
the person still know, right? They still have this sense that they're lying to themselves and lying to everyone else and that they're being fake, right? And this will only serve to increase the level of their um, uh, shame and anger. Okay, exhibitionism. Exhibitionism is another one of these strategies um, that people help to defend against shame. And this is, this is um, in some ways kind of an odd one, right? Because generally, if someone has uh, something that they have a great shame about or that they're afraid of other people knowing, they will generally try to hide it or con conceal it in some way so that no one else can see it or find out about it. The exhibitionists, however, will expose things, but they will go above and beyond. They will be, um, the, the term flamboyant uh, comes to mind when we're talking about the exhibitionists, right? And, uh, and we're gonna read, uh, I'm gonna read uh, some of the uh, components or definitions of, of what it's like. But um, one thought, so in the you know, 60s, 70s or what have you, you would have people that would go around and some people would go around and they would do streaking, right? They, they would be running around naked or whatever. And uh, that's considered as exhibitionism, right? Totally like exposing yourself to the public. So this is what this exhibitionism is like, even though it may not necessarily involve the person getting naked, but they are in a metaphorical sense, you could say they are naked, they are being naked as far as their emotions and their uh, uh, issues that they're dealing with for their shame. The last uh, survival strategy is exhibitionism. This seems to be a paradox because the person who is shamed instead of hiding calls attention to herself. Go ahead, look at me if you want, the exhibitionist seems to say. I've got nothing to hide. This person may act outrageously, flaunting his sexuality, dress, or behavior. The exhibitionist displays what he would really like to hide. For example, many people who were victims of sexual abuse as children suffer deep shame, shame as adults. Some of them, however, discover they feel a little more in control and a little less pain by wearing extremely seductive clothes or by engaging in numerous sexual encounters. They have survived their early shame experiences by converting their embarrassment and humiliation into public flamboyance. Exhibitionism, is a particularly harmful defense against shame. Every time the exhibitionist goes on display, she uh, sets herself further apart from people who are offended or shocked by her behavior. Threats only increases her shame, which she suppresses by showing off all the more. The exhibitionist eventually becomes isolated, alone, the object of scorn or pity, and once again, ashamed. So, okay, and so this is, um, again, exhibitionism and uh, is definitely not helpful. It, it, it serves as some temporary relief, as it mentioned. Um, it could help the person appear to be more in control. So if we're talking about, uh, you know, for example, it's, it's uh, referring to the person who um, has been, let's say, sexually assault assaulted, for example. And so generally you'll see the person, someone who's been sexually assaulted may uh, tend to withdraw from everyone in society in general and may even be afraid to go outside or to expose themselves. They may uh, walk around, be overdressed, like with the clothes and stuff like that, because they don't want to expose themselves. And, um, you know, they may even have problems uh, functioning uh, sexually because of the trauma that they that happened to them, right? And so they they just totally withdraw and it caused problems for future relationships. The exhibitionist uh, goes just the opposite, where they uh, you know tend to expose themselves of, or even become overly sexualized uh, in their behavior. And this is one of their defenses. It's not 
again, it's not that they're a bad person. They're just trying to cope with the trauma associated with what happened to them. Now, again, this is a maladaptive uh, strategy. And all of these strategies that we've, that we've uh, just mentioned are maladaptive strategies. These are not things that we want to incorporate into our uh, anger management. Um, these are things that we want to uh, ideally eliminate, right? And if we are ha if we have any of these, we want to recognize them for what they are, and you know the destructive nature of them, and we want to replace them with more uh, productive and useful strategies um, to help us to address our anger. So, um, and in upcoming lessons, um, we will get into some of the strategies that will actually help us in those things that um, that we actually want to use in order to help us to become, uh, you know, better citizens uh, in the community, you know, better husbands, uh, wives, you know, sisters, brothers, what have you, um, and learning to deal with our families better, learning to address situations better, uh, learning to conduct ourselves in a more appropriate way when we're at work, school, or some other uh, situation. So um, these things are uh, going to be helpful. All right. So, all right, we'll make this a uh, short lesson. We'll see you for lesson three.